So much for 2018 then, another year down, another crap load of awesome vintage and modern toys in the bag and now my present to you is this rather personal top 10 list that only I give half a shit about. Following on from last year's top 10 releases I thought I would continue the format but only because I'm a creature of habit and now I have to do this every friggin year. Before we get stuck in, let's have a quick rundown of last year's list. At 10, you son of a bitch, it's SDCC exclusive NECA Predator Jungle Brief in Dutch. Number 9, is he dead? Is it a coma? Make your bloody mind up. SDCC exclusive 1000 Toys Bait Alpha Industries 12 inch Duke. Number 8, Gear Sir Bluey, SDCC exclusive Star Wars Black Series Grand Admiral Thrawn. At number 7, Alien TMNT Crossover Repaint Genius, it's the SDCC exclusive NECA Sewer Mutation Alien. At number 6, Short Lived But Full of Potential, SDCC exclusive Hasbro IDW Revolution Box Set. At number 5, Good Night Sweet Lionheart, Boss Fight Studio Knight of Accord. At number 4, a vote that wasn't wasted or regretted for a change, Hasbro Transformers Titans Return Trypticon. At number 3, Poking Chodes and Croaking Toads all over the Aniverse, Boss Fight Studio Bucky O'Hare and Jenny. Such heroic nonsense at 2, Takara Tomy Transformers Masterpiece Megatron. And finally, number 1, SDCC exclusive NECA TMNT Vinyl Collector's Case. Radical dudes. A pretty solid list of goodies and I must say that 2018 has also delivered. Now just so you know the rules, this is my personal top 10 of toys that A were released in 2018 and B I actually purchased. It's all my own opinion of course, so if you don't like it, it doesn't really matter. So starting at 10, because imagine if we did it the other way around, I have gone for yet another figure from a company that sees a lot of action in my lists, a company and a convention in actual fact. Yes, it's NECA, yes, it's another SDCC exclusive, and yes, it's Hawkins from Predator. Last year we were spoiled with a whopping six appearances in the top 10 from SDCC exclusive product as well as three honourable mentions, so it's no surprise that this year's con fills out some spots in this list too. With the Hawkins release, we get ever closer to the promised land of completing this epic team who are definitely Nat Assassins. This character, although probably lower down the list than most of the guys from the movie, has an important role to play on and off screen. The actor Shane Black has lethal weapon to thank for his part in the original, arguably despite being zero grounds for argument, the best in the series so far, including the most recent The Predator, written and directed by Black. He wrote Lethal Weapon in about six weeks, which landed him a $250,000 deal with Warner Brothers. During the rewrites, Black asked producer Joel Silver for a small acting role in another film Silver was preparing at the time, Predator, a film for which Black also made uncredited contributions to the script. His part in the film is the shortest when discussing the main characters, and not counting Major General Homer Phillips, Anna, any of the militia, or the helicopter pilot that picks Dutch and Anna up at the end. Spoiler alert. Hawkins is that guy who tells really bad jokes and you only really laugh because it's awkward if you don't. They are mostly directed at the guy that never gets them, Billy, but he does serve a purpose in the attack on the compound near the beginning, and based on the fact that he's the communications guy, it's no surprise he is targeted initially by the Predator, and also because he becomes separated from the rest of his team when chasing Anna shortly after the attack on the bad guys. He is dispatched pretty fast with most of the gore happening off screen. He is routinely dragged into the forest, has all of his innards removed, and is hanged up by his trotters like most of the Pred's victims. Necker have been slowly drip feeding us characters from the movie, mainly Arnie in literally every single possible iteration, tons of Preds and a skinned body that may or may not be Jim Hopper, but now we have finally broken into the rest of the team with Hawkins and this makes me super happy. Rick Hawkins gets my number 10 spot on this list and it has nothing to do with his terrible jokes. At 9, I've decided to drop in a G.I. Joe Collectors Club figure here from their recent 7th figure subscription service. Tundra Ranger Stalker was one of those figures I was never sure we would get before the club would cease operations at the end of this very year, but thankfully they found a way and in doing so have created a figure that unfortunately surpassed the entire wave of figures in that lineup and doesn't look like he will be bettered in their final wave of FSS figures or the final 12 and remaining exclusives. The figure was based on the awesome Stalker version 2 from 1989 with that epic kayak and accessory loadout that somehow makes it into this awesome figure as well. 
It's just a shame he doesn't fit into it due to the fact that the newer modern figures are ever so slightly bigger and bulkier than their vintage predecessors, and they use the vintage kayak mold for this new release. Oddly enough, I'm still glad they included it, but it's one of the few reasons it only gets as high as 9. I also have a close connection to the original, as he was one of many Joes I bought while on holiday in the US back in 1989. The card art was sensational and his new design just blew me away. That and the fact that he was carded with a bloody vehicle, and I was sold. Well, he was sold to me. Or more accurately, my parents. In any case, he gets in at 9 thanks to some strong nostalgia and the fact that they nailed the build. Sold. To me. My first honourable mention has to go to the club's final 12, and more specifically the European exclusive homage to the Tiger Force figures, but they don't make the list because they won't be in hand until next year, even though I've already paid for them. Already paid a lot for them. Anyway, they needed a mention for being bat crazy and based yet again on something very close to my nostalgia button that just so happens to be shaped like a nipple. I actually have two of those buttons and a slightly smaller third one that is located much lower down. In at number 8, and it's a first appearance for Takara Tomy's Transformers Masterpiece line. It was slim pickings for MPs this year, and I'm not talking about an old blues guitarist. A lot of repaints and only a handful of original moulds if you count the movie series meant that the G1 crowd were a bit starved of product in 2018, but it was a great treat to get the Sunstreaker mould used again, and in the form of Corden. Not James Corden, although Carpool Karaoke would be so much better inside the Transformer. No, Corden. The homage to the Diaclone Police Deco that we had prior to Hasbro getting their nefarious money mittens all over the toys and rebranding them as Transformers. Wicked easy repaint really, but hella effective, and adds to the huge team of Cybertronian emergency services. Number 8 is for you, Corden. Not that one. Crossing over at number 7 are not one, but two sets of figures, because I couldn't choose between them. The Street Fighter 2 Transformers crossover sets from Takara Tomy. I have to admit, when these sets were initially revealed I barely raised an eyebrow, and then I actually saw the product images, and I was sold so hard that both eyebrows came off my face and glued themselves to the ceiling of my house. I've never been a fan of the transforming crossovers like the Marvel or Star Wars attempts, but there was something infinitely cooler with these Street Fighter influenced bots. Because these were Japanese releases, they opted for the original names that the Japanese game used, so the M. Bison deco on Megatron is actually Vega. He is packed with a triple changing convoy in the Ryu paint scheme. They work really well, but even more so in the second two pack that features Ken as Hot Rod, an almost perfect blend of deco and personalities there, and Chun Li, who uses the RC mold and arguably the best figure crossover in both sets combined. The deco on the RC mold is so perfect that you would be forgiven for thinking it wasn't a transformer at all, but she is and she's awesome. As a Street Fighter fan I'm all for this and I hope that we get follow-up sets of Ultra Magnus Sangeef and a Rhinox Blanker of some sort to cover the Beast Wars era. Hey, a boy in a man's body can dream, okay? In an odd twist of fate, Number 6 happens to be another Street Fighter reference and thanks to Hasbro, we finally have an update to the G.I. Joe Street Fighter 2 Ryu action figure from 1993, courtesy of their really cool 4-inch Gamerverse figure packs. There have been 4 sets released to date with no news of any others to come, but I'm sure we will get some kind of reveal in 2019. Cross his fingers until snapping noises are heard. We got an Iron Man and Mega Man set initially and due to some solid sales it led to three more two-packs including Civil Warrior vs Marvel's The Collector from the Contest of Champions game, Spider-Man vs Mr Negative from the Spider-Man game currently dominating the universe on PS4, and my personal favourite that includes my number 6 in this list, Ryu, who comes with Black Widow from Marvel vs Capcom Infinite. Ryu is just fantastic. I count him as a Joe really just because the scale is so spot on, and having a figure in the G.I. Joe line in the 90s means that I just assume he should be included in the same breath as the other modern Joe figures. The same company made him in terms of the vintage figure itself, and they make the modern versions of Joe figures too, so therefore he is part of that team for me. I don't care what anyone else says, I fully expect this figure to be included on the G.I. Joe reference mega website yojo.com in the future, as Ryu version 3. If it doesn't happen, you'll be hearing from my lawyers by and Balrog and Blanker Incorporated. In all seriousness though, I feel like this could open the floodgates for other Street Fighter characters to be created, especially Ken and Akuma who share the same design and could therefore share the majority of the same tooling. A few head sculpts and some repaints, and you already have a lot of figures before you even begin looking at other characters. At the very least, if we don't see a Championship Edition version of Ryu, I will be very disappointed and will possibly Hadouken every motherfucker in the entire building. Ryu at 6 then. Sure you can! 
Halfway there, and at number 5 I have chosen Boss Fight Studio Vitruvian Hacks Series 2 Vandar the Wandering Warrior. When Boss Fight Studio make toys, I'm pretty sure they have to perform a human sacrifice to extract the soul and infuse it into the manufacturing process in order to reach the heights of incredible quality that they always seem to manage. It's the only explanation I can think of that allows them to produce such works of art. I can feel the trapped soul of a wandering warrior within this amazing figure, or it could just be the Mexican food I had earlier. Either way, there is no way to display this wonderful toy without him looking incredibly bad Trust me, I tried, it's not possible. He comes with two heads and a bunch of epic accessories, so you can have multiple looks and designs and the fact that those options are available makes him a very versatile figure. So versatile in fact, you can have a rather diverse array of warriors in different loadouts and form your own barbarian team. Considering there are a number of shared parts in the build and accessories, it's amazing to me that a new character has been born out of them. He looks so fresh and new, and those head sculpts are just exceptional. Congratulations, Boss Fight. You continue to keep making toys I crave to own. Vandar at 5. Another honourable mention here has to go to the Gargoyle in the same wave as Vandar. I absolutely love the deco design and cute accessories, but Vandar edged her out by sheer bad alone. At number 4 in its Transformers Masterpiece again, we have Takara Tomy's Transformers Masterpiece Beast Wars Dinobot. It was only natural to expect a figure like Dinobot after we had the awesome Primal, Cheetor, Primal again, Shadow Panther, and with Megatron just around the corner, it looks as though the Beast Wars era is slowly building a very solid lineup. I fully expect Megatron to be in next year's list, just FYI. Dinobot looks so impressive in both modes, but his robot mode is fantastic. He gets a plethora of accessories as most of these awesome toys do, including the mysterious recurring golden disc that helped to seal his fate in the Beast Wars episode Code of Hero. In a final showdown with Megatron, Dinobot managed to destroy the disc with his last ounce of strength shortly before the spark left his body. Spoiler alert. I like doing my spoiler alerts after the fact. Coming back to the awesome figure though, there was a slight quibble over his kibble in Beast Mibble, I, I mean mode, but I really think he looks great, and I thought they did a great job on the figure as a whole. Well done Dinobot, you came top, if top ended at fourth. Honourable mention to Shadow Panther here, but lost out to Dinobot as he was a repaint of Cheetor. Still bloody good however, and worth an honourable mensch right here. Okay, now it's getting serious. We're into the top three, and next up at number three we have Boss Fight Studios' second appearance in this year's list with a figure that was so highly anticipated I nearly croaked all of my toads when it was revealed, Bucky O'Hare's very own Dead Eye Duck. My love for this franchise and especially for this character comes directly from the Bucky O'Hare animated series and toy line that I fell for in a rather large-eared way back in 1991. The design for Dead Eye Duck was one of the most outlandish things I'd ever seen, and is still up there to this day in terms of insanity. A four-armed duck wearing an orange jumpsuit, baseball hat and eye patch, who talks like a pirate and shoots an obscene amount of guns. What's not to like, seriously? I always loved my Bucky toys, even though they came up short in a few minor areas, like the weapons not being able to fit on certain pegs on the figure, and some fixed poses that could cause issues in standing upright. Despite those problems, it didn't stop me having lots of fun with them, and in particular Dead Eye Duck. When Boss Fight revealed they had obtained the license to make these figures, I nearly cried, because I knew fully well that we were in for an absolute treat of action figure construction and quality. Guess what? We were not disappointed. Bucky and Jenny turned out great, and before I could even say the phrase, Croker some toads, we already had images of a painted sample Dead Eye circulating the web to net, and he looked sensational. When I got him in hand, he was everything I had imagined and more. The design was on point, deco popped beautifully, and the features like the peg holes and pegs for the weapons actually worked. The detail in this sculpt is mind-blowing, and he is scaled so well with the other figures that it looks like they all stepped off the screen directly from the animated series or from the pages of the comic. He was highly anticipated and happily welcomed into my collection, and now I look forward to the next characters that Boss Fight are producing for the line. I'm looking at you, Bruiser. Well done to Dead Eye Duck, who fires his way into the number three position. I also have to mention the awesome Corsair Canard repaint at this stage too, as well as that awesome lunchbox. One extra special touch that I have to give Boss Fight credit for is the inclusion of the European exclusive colour weapons he comes with. The purple blasters that Dead Eye had back in the day as well as the orange blaster Bucky came with. It's the attention to detail that makes this line so special for me. 
now it's getting sweaty. In at number two is another Boss Fight Studio Bucky figure, and it is edged out Deadeye mainly due to the fact that he is newer and shinier, and I am shallow like that. The Bucky O'Hare Storm Toad Trooper. Everything I said before stands here as well. The brand is close to my heart, and considering we haven't really had anything Bucky related since the early 90s is sort of a tragic disaster, but thanks to Boss Fight Studio, what we are getting here is effectively a masterpiece range of action figures. The Storm Toad Trooper is no exception. Incredible update to a rather flawed original toy and so full of personality and great design, you can practically hear them croaking. The accessories are fun and plentiful, allowing for a number of different looks, so army building can be diverse enough yet still maintain that uniformity across the board. He really is a superb figure, and quite rightly slots in at number 2 despite only making it into this year's list as a release. Thank goodness he did, because I was running out of stuff to put in. And that, of course, brings us to number one, if you've been counting along. We have reached the promised land of the top 10 toys of 2018, but before we see use numero uno, here's a quick recap from 10 through 2. Shane Black's biggest achievement has been immortalised at long last, SDCC exclusive Rick Hawkins from NECA at 10. Baby, it's cold out. Uh, actually, no, f*** that. G.I. Joe Collectors Club FSS 7 Tundra Ranger Stalker at 9. At 8, we have a masterpiece repaint, and not for the first time in one of my top 10s, Takara Tomy Transformers masterpiece MP42 Cordon. They transformed and hadouken their way into my heart, the Street Fighter 2 Transformers crossover sets from Takara Tomy in 7th. At 6 we have our second Street Fighter 2 reference, but this one is slightly more direct, Hasbro's Gamerverse Ryu. In 5th place it's one of many Boss Fight Studio products in this list, Vitruvian Hack Series 2, Vandar the Wandering Warrior. Not many original Transformers masterpiece figures were made for 2018, but the one they did do finds his way into number 4. Easily the laziest name in the franchise, it's Takara Tomy's Transformers masterpiece Beast Wars Dinobot. The Ducky doesn't give a f**k is at 3, croaking toads all over the place, Boss Fight Studio, Bucky O'Hare, Dead Eye Duck, me lado. Arr. At 2, more of the same from Boss Fight, so good you'll get warts just looking at them, the Boss Fight Studio, Bucky O'Hare, Storm Toad Trooper. And now I can finally reveal my top toy of 2018, and it is the SDCC exclusive NECA TMNT 1990 movie box set, and diorama. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles always seem to do well in these lists. In 2016 it was the NYCC exclusive NECA Shredder and the Foot Clan who hit the top spot, and last year the SDCC NECA Vinyl Collector's Case won it, so it's no surprise that we find a TMNT based NECA product at the peak once again for this year. The focus this time is on the live action TMNT movie from 1990, a film that has garnered cult status since its release, and one that many fans believe to be the best to come out of the franchise thus far. I think the main reason for its popularity has a lot to do with the fact that it sticks religiously to the source material. The Turtles designs were adapted for the big screen, and they all made sense for the individual characters, and so many elements from the original comics made it in with slight tweaks here and there. Instead of Leo getting thrown through the window at Christmas after a beating from the Foot Clan, it was Raphael who was caught unawares on a rooftop, and subsequently dropped through a skylight. The Shredder had his comic look with the red jumpsuit and mysterious helmet, and the rooftop battle even made it in, albeit less violent with a different outcome than the explosive comic story. Either way, we ended up with a really great part of Turtles history and a film that hasn't been improved on in five attempts since. Having said that, the CGI movie was pretty good, but I still prefer the 1991 any day of the week. NECA have been churning out some great figures including the 1990 movie based quarter scale behemoths, and even though they are fantastic, it led a lot of fans to request them in their more palatable 7 inch size. Well, someone was listening, or they planned to do them all along anyway, because here we are with not only a kick set of our favourite 1990 movie based bros, but we also get a massive and extraordinarily heavy diorama to display them with. When this over 18 inches tall and over 2 feet wide street diorama was revealed way back at a convention, people immediately requested that it be released for purchase. Typical people. Thankfully that was NECA's plan all along, and they decided to debut it for the Turtles as a con exclusive at this year's SDCC. You could buy the TMNT set separately, or with the Dio, and of course I had to get both because, duh. It did so well that NECA have revealed plans to release a more generic street scene Dio in 2019, so the ability to buy multiples of these to create huge displays are there as an option, which really makes me sweat in a good and a bad way. On a side note, I would love an industrial Dio for my aliens and preds, so if you're listening guys, chop chop. This set is great, and now we wait for more characters to be revealed from the 1990 movie, like Shredder, Casey, April, Splinter, the Foot Soldiers, Tatsu, Danny. 
Well done for the third year running NECA and TMNT. You are number one yet again. Just make sure I have lots to add for next year's list as well, please. Thank you very much for watching this little video, I hope you enjoyed it. This is absolutely just my personal opinion and I fully expect all of your top 10s to look very different indeed. With that said, make sure you post your list in the comments on my Facebook post or on my YouTube channel. Right, that's it, hope you enjoyed the video, I will be back in the new year with video reviews galore and then hopefully I'll be able to do this again next year. I have been Chris McLeod aka Diagnostic80 and you have been disagreeing with every toy in this list. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.